I'm Dr. Evan Sokowski and welcome to Health and Wellness with Dr. Ed. You know, our health and our wellness is extremely important to us, but what we have to do when we have pets at home is look after them. We are their guardians, we are their caretakers. And winter time and the holiday season kind of imposes a number of things that they're not used to on a daily basis. So I asked my good friend, sometimes a little devilish she is, <laughs> but an actual angel for the animals, Jesse Klepsig from Angels for Animals. Welcome, Jesse, to Health and Wellness with Dr. Ed. Hi, Dr. Ed. How are you? Good. It's a, Jesse's a familiar face to the show, and she's worked, I think, at least 25 years, if not longer than that. Correct. For the care of animals, and she operates An Angels for Animals, which is her rescue agency. But she's gained so much knowledge over the years in doing that. And we're going to pick her brain today and she's gonna be able to give us some good advice on how to take care of our animals. Jess, tell us a little bit about your background. What started you in rescuing animals, dogs in particular? Well, for a short period of time, I worked at the local Humane Society, and I saw what they were doing and how they were doing it. And during my time there, the adoption rate went up to 70% out the door. And some of the board members came through and they said, did you know? And I said, yeah. And that's because I've been calling people, found out they had a want list. People would come in and say, I'm looking for a Yorkie. If you ever get one, give me a call. So I found that list and I said, ah, I started calling people. Adoption rate went up to 70%. So what was happening is people were coming up, writing their names down, saying, I want a particular uh, breed of dog, mm -hmm. and no one was following up. Correct. And, and yeah. that's often a problem when you don't follow yeah. up. But I saw the job that they were doing there and I thought, you know what? And the job was temporary. It wasn't a long-term job. I said, I can do better on my own. And so you did. that's when I went out on my own. Okay. So you don't have a facility. Correct. I do not. So these dogs come to your home and they... Well, we have foster homes and we are what, what you call an, uh, an in-house foster rescue. So that's a big phrase. Explain yes. that one for us. Well, they don't go into a kennel, they go into someone's home and they are actually their pet until we get them into uh, potty training, socialization, feeding them the right food, seeing their temperament and where we can place them because not every home is a good home for every dog. So you're looking for a forever home. Correct. And so mm -hmm. in the interim of that period, you're taking animals that came sometimes from such places anywhere. as anywhere. anywhere. Well, I, I know you've taken a lot of animals over the years from, from puppy mills. Well, I've and taken from puppy mills, from breeders, um, uh, animal control, different, and, and individuals. Oh. I forgot we, excuse me again. Sorry, everybody, I forgot that this, we can get re cell reception here. Um, the, the, um, one of the big things, though, is you also take animals that somebody lost their home yes. uh, because mm -hmm. somebody died or they right. ended up in a, in a convalescent right. home yep. or they had to move mm -hmm. because uh, they lost their home and had to go to an apartment and the apartment complex or the apartment the landlord will not that. allow yeah. animals in the yep. place. Mm -hmm. And that happens quite frequently. Yep. So, so uh, do you find it different from a dog that you rescue that is a breeder dog, puppy mill dog, than one 100% of the dogs from? different, 100% different. And that is one of the biggest problems I have. When I talk to people that are looking for a dog to adopt, they don't understand that. They don't understand the difference. And there's a huge difference between a dog that has already been owned and one that has never had a home. So in other words, one that has some idea of what it is to be cared for and to be loved as opposed to somebody that just gets up every day and waits to be fed. You got it. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I've had a number of dogs over the years from Jesse, I think, what, five, huh, Jess? Mm -hmm. And some of those came from breeders and puppy mills, and I experienced that difference as well. Mm -hmm. And the, the dogs that came from the puppy mills had no orientation nope. uh, of what it's like to be loved, really. They had, they had to learn to be loved right. and to trust. And that was the biggest difference that I saw. Yeah. And I know a couple that I got from you that came that way, uh, 
really didn't even know how to eat properly mm -hmm. because they, I guess they had to scrounge for food when they were with these It was these a competition. It was yeah. a competition. Mm -hmm. and, and then it didn't take long, however, yep. once they gained your trust that they weren't going to be beaten or they were going to be fed mm -hmm. and, and that they integrated. Mm -hmm. And I think at one point I had six, five were from Jesse and one of my dogs was from another word. Now they were all mm -hmm. the same breed. They were all yep. the, Mex the miniature dachshunds, but they, be they packed. Right. And they started to learn from one another. Right. So do you find that to be the case when you bring them in yes. in foster care? Yes. And see, we're very strict on our adoption procedures. And there are probably six definite areas that people have to meet when they want to adopt. That's where you live. Do you have a fenced jar? Do you have a companion in-house dog? That helps tremendously. Then we go to the family members, if they work, and what kind of food they feed the resident dog. Those are the six most important things we ask immediately. So somebody calls you up mm -hmm. at Angels for Animals and says, I'm looking for a dog. And let's say mm -hmm. a Shih Tzu or a Yorkie. You're, yep. you're famous a, for your Yorkies. Thank you. Uh, and you just don't say, okay, I have little... Nope. fluffy over here and nope. and we'll drop them off. Nope. What, what, what's the process? Well, a lot of times these people will see it on Pet Finder and they'll call for a specific dog. But in interviewing them and talking with them and finding out what they really want could be 180 degrees out. So that's basically we, we have to narrow it down. And then uh, we talk to them in depth and then the second interview comes from the foster home. She talks to them and she asks different questions. And she really gets into the nitty gritty of some of the things. A lot of people will say, yes, I have a, a fenced in yard. One side's a hedge, the other side's a garage. That does not constitute a secure fenced yard. So what's the importance for the, your requirement for a fenced yard? The dog has never been out in the yard. It has never been out of the puppy house, never been out of the kennel. They don't know grass, they don't know outside, they don't know noises, they don't know TV, they don't know how to do steps. It's like taking a puppy in a six-year-old or less body, and that's what you're dealing with. And these people don't understand that. There's a process, like you said, they have to become integrated, they have to find out what it is to live in a home before they can go out and be a regular dog. Well. One of my dogs I got from you, Meg Ryan, who was a badly abused dog. Mm -hmm. It was a little sweetheart. She it actually could not walk on the ceramic tile or the hardwood floors in my house. Mm -hmm. And when I, when you first dropped her off, I had to put tiles down. Right. And, and she would hop from towel to towel, mm -hmm. bath towels. And uh, I had another one that didn't know what grass was. Right, they don't. Mm -hmm. They would, she, he, he would go out on the patio and on do its cement. business on the cement because that's what it was used to. Right, they lived in a cement floor. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's it's opened my eyes because my first dogs growing up are all dogs that we, you know, bought and, mm -hmm. and so forth. We did have one rescue dog, um, but it, it lost its home, so it mm -hmm. had already been, been integrated in and potty right. trained and, right. and and knew what it was to be cared for. But some of the dogs, and they turned out to be like the best dogs. Oh yeah, that came from you were really. It was almost shocking how they responded because they were never introduced to mm -hmm. a normal way of life. Right. So you have these foster homes. Define what a foster home exactly is for us. Well, we'll use you as an example. You have a home, you have a fenced in yard, you may have a couple other dogs in your house. You agree to take this dog and start to train it, potty train it, like you said, become its buddy and uh, it'll uh, be socialized with you and anybody else that comes into the house and the other dogs. And then you give me feedback as to the personality of the dog, where you think the dog would fit in best. Not every dog is going to fit in with every family. It depends on a number of things, depending on those six points of criteria that I told you. So a lot of times in talking to these people, we actually go to another dog that suits their situation better. But you take care of that dog, you feed it, and I pay for the food and the vet expenses, but then you take care of it and you start to train it. But you also, as the foster home, have input into that. If we set up an interview, and we go through a, another bunch of criteria for the interview, 
you go with me because we do a home check. We actually, actually go into the house, check out the fence, check the yard, check the home, talk, sit down and talk to everybody, and we see how our dog does with their dog. But you, as the foster parent, go with me. And if you look at me and say, I don't think this is the right place, we leave. You so, have that, uh, that responsibility and also that say so. So as a foster home, you're trying to integrate the dog. You're giving the dog the ability to learn trust. Mm -hmm. you're, you're feeding the dog taking the dog to the vets and you say you pay for all the yep. all the vet bills and mm -hmm. you supply the food as well. Right. How long does a dog generally stay at a foster home? We have had dogs in our foster homes over a year. Because you were not unable to find the right home for Correct. them. Correct. And then you will have a situation where you have two dogs that have bonded, that come together and they have to go together. We had a pair of party Yorkies and we had that situation, they were sisters. And they were small, they were only maybe that big around. And we finally, I think we had them 13 or 14 months, but we did finally found them the right home. And I just talked to the gentleman the other day and he said they're, they're doing fantastic. And I know you follow up and you check. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and that, I took Zach and Zoe from you. Yep. Of course they had different names when you gave them, yeah. but um, they were- uh, They were a bonded pair. On the pair. same leather, yep. mm -hmm. litter bonded pair. Um, and uh, when you first brought, uh, you brought Zach first, mm -hmm. and Zoe was having her she surgery. She was being spayed, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And Zach was a complete wreck because Zoe wasn't there. And the right. minute Zoe was dropped off, you saw the sudden change in Zach. Right. And then I had a, a pair of uh, Odie and Crinkles from, not from you, uh, that, that were together, lost their home, and they were inseparable right and Zach and Zoe were like Lin and Yang mm -hmm. so you can't break those, no, those pairs can't. up uh -uh. and sometimes that's difficult because somebody just wants one dog yes so that's the other thing you as a foster home would evaluate to see if that dog could be by himself and be okay and <clears throat> we've had a couple of those and it's worked out so I know I got a call I don't know I think it was from you and you said I have a dachshund I'm thinking I'm thinking that was Meg Meg Ryan and, and I said, well, I'll, I had just lost Odie, and I said, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll take another one. And you said, well, I have to come and check your house. And you knew me, mm -hmm. but Jessie actually came to my house <laughs> and, and, and did an investigation mm -hmm. and, and did, her, did her interview. And I thought, that's, that's pretty wild. I mean, she knows me. She knows that, that I have these dogs and what I do. And, and, mm -hmm. But she, she still was reluctant to, to let that dog go without her protocols being followed. So go through those guidelines and protocols. So I call you up and say, hey, Jess, I want a dog. No, I don't. <laughs> but, but I, I have I, one for you. No, I know. <laughs> you always do. But I, I want a dog, Jess. What, what, what's the next process? Well, I would talk to you and say, what kind of dog do you want? Do you want young, old? In between, why is that male, relevant? Female. Why is it relevant at the age of the dog? Well, because some people want more to the puppy end, and some people will take a senior dog, and we have a lot of senior dogs, and they they deserve a home too. So, what qualifies a senior dog? What age? Over a certain age, probably six and up, would be a questionable. Because right at six, you're right about the yeah. Mid, mid because on the most of the dogs, I tell everybody, you're looking at at least 15 years. That's the other problem we have. We have a senior citizen, 80 and up. I would like to have a puppy. Uh, why do you think you want a puppy? And then I will go through what the puppy requires and by the end of the conversation, you're right, I don't want a puppy. <laughs> so. Well, puppies require a lot of attention, oh. number one, and you have to have a lot of energy to, to, Big time. to handle a puppy. And they're, you know, they're active, they want to run, they want to play, they want to go for walks. They want to chew. And, and, and you know, you're older, you want to sit around and, and, yeah. and, and knit, yeah. you know, so, and watch TV. So Well, the other thing that enters into that, Ed, <coughs> you say you're 80, and I'll say to the, normally it's a woman will call, every once, once in a while I get a man. Well, you're 80 now, and this puppy is, we'll say a year old, and this puppy's gonna live another 14, 15 years. Where are you gonna be in 14 or 15 years? Yeah, and, and that's a concern, because all of a sudden, you know, you've provided a loving, caring yeah. home for this dog who depends solely on you. Right. 
and you're gone. You're out of the picture. Yeah, and I'll say and to them, I hope you live forever, but in reality, it ain't gonna happen. this is where we are. And there's a moment of silence and they'll say, yes, you're right. So somebody who's elderly and functional, I mean, because you can be like yourself over 50 Thank you. and, and <laughs> you can outrun somebody that's 20, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. your, your activities and yeah. so forth and what you do. You go early in the morning to late at night nonstop. I know you. Mm -hmm. Well, just because you're at a certain age, you could still be eligible for a dog yes. that might be one of the senior dogs that maybe doesn't Older. have 20 years Older. or yes. 10 years exactly. or five years. Yeah, that would work perfectly. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so let's get back. I called you. I said, I want, okay. I want a dachshund. And you said, oh, I just so happen to have one or two or mm -hmm. whatever. What's the next step? Now, at this point, do I know you or you're just a cold call? I'm a cold call. You don't know Okay. Me. Those yeah. are the six things that I would ask you. Where do you live? Okay, you live in Peters Township. <clears throat> do you have a f secure fenced yard? Now, secure means down to the ground where they can't get under it, and there's no holes in it, and it is a fence and not uh, a row of shrubs. See, what people don't realize, and I just want to interject this at this point, we have a lot of wildlife here Correct. in Peters, including coyotes and hawks. Mm -hmm. And that's why, in part, we want a secure fenced yard. And in particular, a small dog is... A target you got and it. is food, and people don't quite realize that mm -hmm. that these hawks can come down. I mean, we have owls that, that are out there, and hawks, eagles, owls, and eagles. Yeah. Yep. And then coyotes. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So so we really have to be concerned about that. Even if you have a fence yard, you don't want to leave your dog out there. I go over that a hundred times, and I tell them the very same thing: you have to be in that yard with the dog. I don't even care if you have the fence; <clears throat> you have to be in that yard with that dog because of the birds. Do you know about the birds? Well, no. What about the birds? Or, yeah, I know about the birds. So you get one or the other. However, what really is a deal breaker is a, an electric fence. I was just going to ask you that, Jess. Yes. You, so so why, why is that a problem? What's, what's well, up with the electric Well, same thing fence? you mentioned. All these animals that are trying to get your dog and eat it, and the neighbor's dog, who's maybe a, a big dog and not exactly friendly, and you have this little cute little fluffy thing here, he's gonna come over and grab your dog and kill it. Guaranteed. Well, exactly right. Mm -hmm. You know, before I moved to Arizona and I lived in Old Trail, I used to walk a mile around my house with the dogs. So when I had the six, would take three out, make a mile, would come back, get another <laughs> three, go out, make the next round. And I had to stop doing that because the people with the electric fences um, either weren't keeping the batteries charged or weren't turning them on or the dogs will get shocked running out, but they're right. not gonna get shocked running back in. Right. And they were coming out and attacking my little dogs mm -hmm. and we literally had to stop talking. Right. I'd tell my dogs, let's go for a walk and they'd look at me like, which they used to love to do, and they'd look at me like, uh, I'm not going out there. Right. Because it was trauma for them. Right. And, and so those electric fences, I think are the biggest waste of money. I always tell people, if you have a big dog, that's, <clears throat> To go to somebody else's yard, they can do that, but you're, it'll keep your dog in, but it's not gonna keep the other dogs out. So the next, the next thing over here, I have a fence. Well, I didn't have one, okay. but you okayed it. Yeah. But I, 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 have, I have the qualifying fence. What's mm -hmm. next? What's the next criteria? Okay, where you live, a fence yard. <clears throat> uh, we always check on the family, how many people are in the family, if they work, <clears throat> if they're, we don't, really head toward the little kids because little kids tend to beat up on the dog and, and I do little dogs now. So we check the family, we talk to them about food and the in-house companion dog. They, most times they have to have an in-house dog. So those would be the important things that we check first. So you have all these things. Okay, now I need to have your vet as a reference, your groomer and three personal friends and one of them can be a relative because I've had relatives squeal on the other relative and say, absolutely, don't adopt a dog to my relative. So that has happened. Some people should not own animals. There's oh, no question about big it. big time. Yep, absolutely. So then once I check all of those, and I do call everybody, we arrange for an interview where we go to the house. We take our dog and go to the house, and then we go from there, and we see how that all works out. 
Okay, so now we've gone through all those steps, and you say this could be a loving home, it meets all my criteria. What's the next step in the procedure? Well, we go to their home, <clears throat> and like I said, we check everything out. Then if it, everything is okay, they sign a contract. And the contract says, if at any point they can't keep the dog, it comes back to me. So why is that important to you? I don't want the dog being thrown out again, going to a, uh, a relative that doesn't really want the dog, or go to, um, you know, a, um, a facility, uh, you know, a traditional, a society. Yeah. A traditional yeah. type of rescue place. And probably about a year and a half ago, I took one back, the owner died, and I went and got her, and I still have her. So, so that, that's a binding, a legal binding yes. document. Yes. Yeah, I, 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 in fact, signed that document yeah. for mm -hmm. you. Yeah, and it also states in there that you get a two-week trial, <clears throat> and if you decide in two weeks, and we even, I one time gave a man three months, and he called me exactly in three months, and he cried on the phone. He said, I love this dog, and I told him when he took the dog, I said, you're going to love this dog. No, I want three months trial period. I said, you got it. In fact, he just called me last summer. The dog had died. Yeah. So he was just so thrilled to death of the dog. Oh, he loved the dog. dog and the, loved the dog. Yeah. Yeah. So that is important because you want that dog back. Yep. I want to know where it went. Mm -hmm. Do you follow up all the time with everybody? To a certain extent. You can't bug people all the time. But a lot of people send us pictures. They'll text us with information and stuff like that. So there is a period of time we do keep in contact. So over these years, how many dogs would you say you've found homes for? I should have really wrote it all down. <laughs> I know with one foster home we had, she had 500 of our dogs in the time that she was a foster home for me because she kept track. And you've had a numer numerous foster homes over the years. Yeah, you, different you ones. I haven't had a lot, but the ones I have had were decent. Yeah, That's important too. Yeah, because... Homes. You're, you're taking, say, a dog from the puppy mill, and what that dog learns at that foster home is going to carry forward yeah. at that point. And I expect you to help there and to train that dog and get it ready to be adopted. So when you say you, you take care of all the, the vet bills, the veterinarian bills, mm -hmm. what, what do you do before you, you... Before I adopt the dog out? Yes. We spay or neuter. We get the shots up to date. We check the teeth. <clears throat> when the dogs come in, we treat their ears for ear mites and we look at everything else as a whole. But that comes with the price of the dog because we do charge a fee. We have to do that. Oh, absolutely. So yeah. let's, let's interject. How, how do you fund Angels for Animals? I work. <laughs> so everybody knows age, Je Jesse drives working. buses, <laughs> bus for Peters Township High, uh, the School District. Yeah. Um, you've been doing that for how many years? Jess? 26. If you get behind that bus, it goes real slow. <laughs> <laughs> but um, every once in a while, I'll be driving by on, on Bebot Road, and I'll hear, and it's yeah. Jesse blowing the horn on the bus. Yep. Uh, but uh, you do that bus driving solely to fund Angels for Animals. A good bit of it, yeah. yeah. We have a few small fundraisers, but not a lot. And then you do a couple other things like uh, tin cans, aluminum cans. What? Oh, yes. I have a contingency of people that collect aluminum cans for me, which is mostly dog food cans, beer cans, cat food cans, or sometimes aluminum. And then, uh, in fact, my husband got in, involved in that this summer. I asked him, I said, can you help me take these to the crusher? He said, yes. And when he was done, he said, wow, what a job. I'll tell a funny story. <laughs> I laughed. <laughs> So, so funny. <laughs> so one day I pull in Jeff in, in Jesse's driveway and she says, I gotta show you something. Now Jesse has an old classic car and I'm into cars and and uh, her husband Pete has a couple old classic cars, she's always working on them and and um I'm th I'm thinking she's opening up the garage door to show me this wonderful car and the whole garage is full with <laughs> with bags and bags yes. of aluminum cans. And yeah. and she was real proud of that that, that big collection. But uh, so mm -hmm. you do get some money from doing that. Yeah, they pay you so much a pound depending on what the market price is, yeah. And then you do something else that I'm aware of. What's that? Well, we sell the Enjoy Coupon books, and recently we developed a uh, rainbow bridge bracelet and earrings, and we sell those, and they're very popular too. So how do you get those into the hands of people that want them? I take them with me everywhere I go and show them. So you have the joy books and the and the jewelry with you all the time. Yeah, and you start and a conversation. And the cans, like I say, a certain contingency of people 
have different areas and they will collect them for me and bring them and they meet me and I bring them to my house and we go to the crusher after them. So, so do you take donations from people? Yeah, but I don't get a lot of donations. <clears throat> there are certain people that have funded me for a long time, like my financial advisor. Uh, there's another gentleman that years ago, he adopted a dog from me and he absolutely loved that dog. I just got a really nice check from him yesterday in the mail. Nice. He, and it's been years, you know, but he'll call me occasionally. He'll say, are you still doing it? He writes me a check. Yeah, yeah. It, it, what's really, it, it's nice that people can do that. And, yeah. that. and probably if you ask a little more, people would, would probably contribute I don't like a little to do more. That. But I know you don't like yeah. to ask. Jesse's been on my radio show, Health and Wellness with Dr. Ed, numerous times. And uh, I, I think just about every time you, you're on the show, somebody out of the blue just sends you a check. Well, we found a very good gentleman who owns the Pet Supplies Plus out in Robinson, and he has really been really good to us. In, Not so much in money, but in, in donating food and things like that. And that's yeah. important because you oh, have absolutely. to buy every, every bag of food, every can mm -hmm. of food that you give to your foster yep. care. How many animals in foster care do you currently have? I have, uh, we just picked up a little girl yes, the other day. Um, so let's see, I think we have about four, four or five. That's it. You're that's a yeah. you're kind of down on mm -hmm. the, yeah. on the number. And then and you have how many personally? I have four myself. Myself, yeah. So, um, but we've taken them off the internet now because of the holidays. We don't adopt during the holidays. Yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Why it's why you do that? Yeah. Uh, well, since you brought it up, let's talk about it. Let's get it out. <coughs> well, people are too busy. They're shopping. They're putting up their tree for Christmas or whatever they're doing, baking and having parties and all that. <clears throat> that's not a time to get a new dog because you have to devote time to that new animal. So we just take everything down and then by probably first week or so in January, we'll put them back up again. And then there's always that issue right around Christmas time where, where you want to give a puppy to your grandchild or to your, to your no. son or daughter. And, uh, we or, don't do gifts. Yeah, mm -mm. and that becomes an issue why. <clears throat> well, I'll tell you one story. We, we have about 30 seconds for you to tell that in, Jess. Okay. Somebody said they wanted a dog for their mom and dad. I said, I have to talk to mom and dad. Mom and dad said, why do they think I want a dog? That's the story. Because you have to want the dog. Yeah. You know, and, right. and you know, my whole life I've had them. Mm -hmm. I don't have any right now. And everybody thinks I should. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I've told a couple of friends who said, well, we're getting you a dog. And I said, well, then we're not friends any longer because I'm too busy now. Right. Your and lifestyle has a lot to do with it. My yeah. lifestyle mm -hmm. has changed. Yep. And, and uh, you know, <clears throat> I want to travel. I wanna, now, right. I had Tucker who was paralyzed. We, I traveled with him all the time. Right. Exactly. would take some of the other ones with me. But it was always a, a different trip. Right. And it's, it's when you have that commitment to those animals, you your lifestyle is based around them. That is absolutely right. And mm -hmm. you know, so so I'm not eligible for dogs anymore because I'm traveling and. Well, let's and just say right now. No, forever. Right. No, no, I don't. No. I don't believe that. No. <laughs> we're we're we'll be, we're going to take a break. Okay. We'll be back with health and wellness with Dr. Ed with Jesse Klesson. Thank you. back at Health and Wellness with Dr. Ed. I'm Dr. Ed Sokowski, and we're here with Angels for Animals, Jesse Klepsik. Before the break, Jess, we were talking about Christmas and, and why you don't adopt dogs out, and I think that's a, a very wise decision you've made over the years, because I think it, it prevents the bring back, mm -hmm. you know, because sometimes people shouldn't be getting dogs and somebody just thinks they need one. and and by not allowing them to be rescued during this period, you prevent that. So that's that's a very wise decision. But there's some things that go on around Christmas, Christmas that I think you should make people aware of. Because it's a strenuous time for everybody because your, your routines change, <laughs> you know, you're going to parties, you're having parties, your work schedule can change. Mm -hmm. 
you have these animals that all this suddenly becomes new to them because it's not their routine and animals really operate on a routine right and you've changed it all of a sudden so what are some of the downsides of the holiday season and pets that we have in the house well, in addition to what you have just mentioned, people are really just too busy. But a lot of people are not aware of the hazards in their own house. With all the Christmas trees, the decorations, the food, you could knock bulbs off the tree. Dog could walk on one of those pieces of glass and really hurt itself. You have people that come over and they eat different food, and of course they want to give the dog some too and they don't think about the toothpick that may be in that piece of food or the fact that that food is not good for them. Or, or even laying the food out on a, on a counter or on a coffee table and the dog helping itself to right. that. And a bigger dog would do that, yeah. yeah. I don't know that all our dogs could reach that, but yeah. Well, my little dachshunds could put their paws up on a coffee table and grab, uh -huh. you know, so I mean, they yeah. generally didn't do that, but right. they could. Yeah. Uh, so and then you gotta watch out for all the cords. You're running all kind of electrical cords all over the house to, you know, keep the lights going. So there's a strangling issue that can happen there because a dog could be playing around there and roll over it around and the cord. How about electrocution? How about electrocution because they want to bite on it That's all right. the time. That's right, chew. That's an interesting thing that people don't realize. Yeah. Dogs chew all the time. Yes. That's their sense. Right. And even bulbs hanging from a Christmas tree, mm -hmm. they can bite thinking it's a play toy. Right and bite into that bulb and it shatters and cuts their mm -hmm. their their mouth and so forth swallowing it and, oh. and so forth yep. so th there are a lot of issues um and i i think even like needles from a tree mm -hmm. or, or plants that dogs want to chew on yeah plants you should always keep up no matter what they are because you don't always know if they're poisonous or if they're going to have a bad reaction on a dog so i would say any plants you have in the house have them up or, <clears throat> excuse me, in a place where the dogs can't get them or chew the leaves or anything, then you know that doesn't enter into the picture if the dog gets sick. Well, I've always heard this, and I, and I know it to be a myth, that ponzettas, which are around at Christmas time generally only, uh, are, are, are poisonous to dogs. Well, I, my research tells me that's not the case, but we still don't want your dog eating or your cat right. eating, eating this, this plant. Well, I have to tell you about this one plant I have at home. It is now a tree. But the nursery told me, if I would take one of those leaves and brew a cup of tea and you drank it, you'd be dead. I will never have tea at Justin's <laughs> house ever again. <laughs> but that's the, the plant, and that's what she was alerting me to, that that is a very poisonous plant. So don't let the dogs get near, don't you do anything with the leaves or anything, you know what I'm saying? So well, when I lived in Arizona, my one whole back wall of my house uh, was oriander. Mm-hmm. And that's extremely poisonous. And it, you know, it brought shade and brought privacy. But with my dogs, when I was out there with those guys, mm -hmm. I, I you know, was always cautious about what they were doing. Right. Because they tend to pick everything up with their mouths. Right. And, and orea oriander is very toxic mm -hmm. and poisonous. So, so you, but when you really in doubt. Be careful. That's the message, you gotta be careful. Yeah, when in doubt, put it somewhere else. And I think one of the big things, you have people stopping by, probably even in this in the time of COVID, coming over and so forth, and you're opening the doors or, or, and people going in and out. That's a biggie. And, and you're not, you don't realize that mm -hmm. your animal has slipped out. Right. And it happens frequently enough. Now you're out there searching. Right. And, and you really have to be careful. Oh, very, very careful, yeah. And other people don't even look at that. <clears throat> but there, so as the pet owner, you have to be highly aware of that. And if there is a, a, a door, and this is what we look at in part when we go to check out the home. If there is a door that just goes outside, we tell the, the people that you gotta be very careful when anybody comes in or out. So if you have a fenced yard, you should always take that animal out that door that goes into the yard so that they become accustomed to that. And if you have company coming in, Put the dog in another room or a lot of people crate their dogs, put it in there for a few minutes till everybody's in and the door's shut. So you don't have to worry about that. Well, we talk about the dogs developing a routine and they know that routine, that's what they live by. Right. Uh, I mean, we do it as people as right. well. Mm -hmm. And you break our routine and we have trouble. Yep. Dogs, it's, it's more intensified. And all of a sudden, you have this quiet home where there's just maybe one kid, two dogs, parents, whatever. Now you have people coming in and out and it, the dogs don't understand what, what's right. going on over here. And their anxiety level goes up. 
and that can even influence how aggressive they become. Exactly. So you so you really got to think about mm -hmm. how what you're doing in this little short period of time between mm -hmm. no, middle November and, and January, uh, and how that's impacting your pet. That's a big reason why we don't adopt during the holidays because you don't have the time, like I said before, to devote to that animal, and you've got all that commotion, and that just doesn't work. Doesn't work. So, so what happens, Jess? What, what's your advice if you have a dog that does get out? What, what's the first thing you do? I would call everybody, police, neighbors, get the posters, like you've seen a lot of them on the, the different poles and stuff that the animals lost. And a lot of times they'll tell you, don't chase the dog because you, you scare the dog. Right. So the best thing to do is report it to the owner. That's normally the number on that lost and found sheet of paper on the telephone pole. And then they can go and try to find the dog. But you talk to everybody you know, let them all know, and I think there's a couple places on the website, mylostdog.com or something. <clears throat> you can put, list the dog on there. That, and people, if they see the dog, a lot of them will call you and tell you. So one of the, I think the interesting thing is, a dog is not gonna leave the house and walk up a hill. So if you notice the dog is out, you need to start going downhill right away right to away. look for that dog because it's going to take the the path of least resistance yeah and, and i don't think people realize that so they'll start going this way and that way when yeah. you really want to go down because that's where the dog's going to walk downhill i'll tell you a very short story we had one of our dogs the one with the one eye he walked across the street he'd never been across the street before and this was in february coldest time in february we looked for that dog all night and couldn't find him so the next morning my husband went out and he, at that time there was a golf course up over the hill, but there was a stream that ran down through the, the property. And a friend of mine called me and she said, follow the stream because they need water. He did and he got to the top of the hill on the other side of the road. There were a couple guys up there hunting and they saw him looking and calling the dog's name. And they said, are you looking for a little black and tan dog? He said, yeah. He said, well, we just saw him, and we knew he was somebody's dog because all the tags on his collar were tinkling when he would walk. You know, that dog was so disoriented, he didn't know Pete, and Pete had to sit down, take his hat off, and sit there and talk to him, and he finally caught him. He carried him home, and the dog never left the yard after that, but he was so scared. He was so out of it. He didn't know where he was. Sure. It wasn't his area, but that can happen when the dog gets out the door. They don't know where they are. You gotta think about it. A dog, a mature dog, is about the mental state of a three-year-old mm -hmm. human being. Yeah. And you can understand how they get confused and, and right. so forth when their surroundings change That whole change world like changes that. when they get into a, a, a totally new area, you know? So y you bring up that story, well, we're in the midst of winter, it's cold. Yep. So how does that impact what we should do for our dogs? Well, the first thing, you, if you take your dog out to the yard to relieve itself, you should have a coat on them. A lot of people get the dogs used to booties, but limit your time there. <clears throat> Go out with the dog, see that he does his business and bring him back in. Don't leave him out there, don't tie him out there. Don't ever tie a dog out in the yard. That's, yeah, that's, that's even a ridiculous concept. Winter or concept. summer, and I always say, you can tell you take your shoes off. If you can walk on that surface in your bare feet and you're comfortable, it's okay for your dog, whether it's hot or cold, because this applies to summer too. If not, don't walk the dog on that hot, hot or cold surface. And just like you go out in the wintertime, we shovel all the snow so that we're down to the grass area for our dogs. Pete will go around the house with a snow blower to give them pathways to go. But there again, be with them and don't leave them out there for long periods of time. And if they have real short hair, you need a coat on them. Yeah, as you know, I had coats for yes. all of my dogs. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I would open up the door and say, let's go out and there'd be snow or rain, they would look at me like, okay, we're not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so, they had you trained, right? <laughs> yeah, they had me trained. And, that, and that's actually what the dogs do. Yeah. The dogs train mm -hmm. you. And I think that's what you do when you adopt the dog out. Mm -hmm. You train the owner, mm -hmm. the potential owner. Yep and uh, people don't really realize that, but that's actually what happens. Mm -hmm. So what about Vaseline on paws? Yeah, and there's that other, uh, there's a, uh, I forget what it's called, but the mushers use it on the, the sled dogs. You coat the bottom of the feet and it will protect them. 
So <coughs> besides the cold and the snow and the ice, I mean, dogs can slip and get hurt and, and salt. so forth. Salt. Salt. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a big one. Why is that an issue? They lick their paws constantly, and so they ingest all that, whether it's good for them or not. It's not a regular salt. It's a, it's a know, corrosive uh, ingredient. It's a mineral that's very corrosive, and it actually yeah. can burn their yeah, pads yeah. and so forth. So, so it's hard these days because everybody's you know worried about throwing right. out something mm -hmm. to melt the snow and the ice. That you probably sh every time you take your dog out should be wiping down the paws and cleaning the. Yep. The dog's paws. Or just have a little pan of warm water there and stick their paws in it and wipe them off as you come through the door. So during the holiday season, and I just thought about this, one of the things that people do, and maybe more than usual, is mm -hmm. drink alcohol. Uh, that's very bad if a dog consumes the alcohol. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want to leave a beer, a glass of beer sitting or... Uh, you know, some type of open liquor glass, because the dog... They'll try it. They'll try it, mm -hmm. Ex exactly. Yep. So, so people are in chocolate. Yeah, so that's you, bad too. Yeah, chocolate has uh, theobromine in it, and the theobromine <coughs> is 100 times more potent than, than um, uh, caffeine. So we know that caffeine races the heart a little bit. Theobromine races it 100 times more. Wow. And there are certain breeds of dogs that are actually potentially affected more by the theobromine than others. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Lapsu apsus, mm -hmm. for example, uh, uh, can really be impacted by chocolate. Yeah, also nuts, yeah. Uh, especially well, macadamia nuts. Macadamia mm -hmm. nuts are toxic They're to poison. dogs. Yep. Yeah, grapes. Yep, raisins. Raisins. Raisins are even more toxic because it's concentrated. <coughs> That's true. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and people don't realize that mm -hmm. you know uh, corn on the cob the, the cob is toxic to the dog yep. um, so so you have to really make yourself aware fortunately you can get online and and look at that stuff and it's there sometimes you have to read through the filters but well you know you're bringing up uh, bad foods and stuff like that <clears throat> a lot of times people will buy for the dog as a gift or a chew a pig's ear or rawhide. So you big deals, what's wrong, wrong with that? Pig ear will splinter in their stomach and it'll bleed. Rawhides, it is a piece of leather. If they chew off a piece and it gets stuck choke. here or in their intestines, I, I had this happen with two dogs I adopted out. The lady called me and she said, nylon, because that's nylon and they chewed off pieces and that cuts the throat as it goes down. Yeah. It got stuck, she had to have them operated on her. It cost it $3,000 a dog to open that dog up and remove it. Yeah, mm -hmm. Th those are big issues. Yeah, And um, people don't even think that. Oh, it's a good chew. No, it's not a good chew. Yeah, there, were, there was a time when, when the greenies, you're familiar with greenies, because mm -hmm. they have chlorophyll in them, and yeah. they were just, they're shaped like toothbrushes, yes. and they were, had the, mm -hmm the marketing that you were cleaning your dog's teeth, mm -hmm. but they're full of gluten, and the gluten was actually blocking the dogs and swelling up inside the stomach and killing the dogs. It was, a, I don't know how many years, that was a number of years ago, there was yeah, a recall, and they changed, yeah. they changed the formula they a did, little yeah. bit, mm -hmm. you know, but you really have to be aware of what you're handing to that animal. That animal's gonna take whatever you give them, right. for the most part. They don't know. Yeah, and, um, you're the one that needs to know, right? You know, even um, Gorilla Glue, which I think most people have probably sitting in their house. For some reason, that's tasty to the dogs. Uh huh. But what it does is it swells up their stomach and they die. Ooh. So, so even something like that you wouldn't think about Gorilla Glue. Mm-hmm. So the lot, lot to having uh, lot of to things. be aware of when you have yeah. an animal. You know, so that you don't get yourself in trouble, get your dog in trouble. Isn't that funny? People will focus on the children. They'll keep all that stuff away from the kids. But when it comes to the dog, they never give it a thought. Yeah. So one of the things I know that you think about a lot is, uh, besides animal wellness, is animal nutrition. Right, the food. So why is, why is food important? <laughs> why isn't it important? Yeah, well. I mean, you know, <laughs> look at all the crap they put in it. You know. Well, uh, you know, pet food didn't exist until like 1940s, 1950s, early 50s. Dogs just ate whatever scraps people had. Were left Probably over for lived lunch a, and dinner. Were a lot healthier. Yeah. yeah. 
And uh, with this overabundance of corn and soy, they came up with pet food, which all became a you know marketing ploy. But you know why? It was convenient. <coughs> they didn't have to cook it. They didn't have to fix it. They just took it out of a bag and put it in the dog's dish. So that yeah. was easy. So most of us, you know, for years, as you know, all I did was make my own food for my dogs, mm -hmm. which I'm not a cook. It was easy in a crock pot. Throw the ingredients in, proper ingredients, make the food. You got it for a week. Keep mm -hmm. it in the refrigerator, freeze it, thaw it. There you go. You know, chicken, beef. Never pork. Oh, Pork's no, not good no. for a dog. No. So it isn't inconvenient to make your own food. It is to a lot of people. Maybe not you and I, but a lot of people. So it's easy to get a can, easy to get a, a bag of food. Yeah. So, and I know you have to do that as a foster, foster mm -hmm. care person for the dogs. What, what do you look for as ingredients when you're buying food? No corn, soy, gluten, or byproducts. Well, that's a mouthful, Jess. No corn, soy, gluten, or byproducts. Okay. Byproducts is all the crap that so, they sweep up off the floor. Well, let's <laughs> talk. Let's talk about corn. Why no corn? We silo the corn, and that picks up a fungus, and that kills your immune system. Uh, yeah, actually, on on top of what you just said, the corn is unable to be digested by the dog. Dog has no requirement, uh, mm -hmm. for no ability to digest, right. no enzymes to digest that corn. So when you feed, yes, the dog will feel full. But and they doesn't put, give them any nutrition. You know, and they put fats on that food for them to eat it, to mm -hmm. enjoy it. You know, the worse it smells, the more a dog wants to eat it, right? And, but they're not getting any nutrition from it. Right. And it's all marketing if you really look at it. If you see, a, you see this first ingredient, it'll say like beef. But in fact, they don't mean prime rib steak that you just had for, for dinner. We can talk a little bit about that later. Yeah. <laughs> but the next ingredient is corn. But th the beef is the first ingredient only by weight because it's a wet product and it's heavier than that powdered corn. Mm -hmm. But in fact, there could be way more corn in there yeah. than than meat protein. Well, how do you feel about potatoes? I see that in a lot yeah, of places. I, I, I don't think that's I don't really good. think that any nightshade should be given to a, a dog whatsoever. Yeah. And potatoes are part of the nightshade family. Yeah. And it's not all starch. So if you look at corn and you look at wheat and you look at um, potatoes, all of those are starches. They're all sugars. Your dog and your cat has no ability whatsoever to process that sugar. Yeah. No way to break it down no way to use it as nutrition, no need for it, in fact. So what are you doing? You're giving your dog sugar. What about peas? I see there's an awful lot of peas and stuff anymore. There, there is proteins in peas, uh -huh. except there, with, with peas you get something produced called lectin. So all these beans and legumes and so forth all produce lectins in, in your body, in your dog's body, and lectins create uh, what's called leaky gut syndrome or dysbiosis medically is the medical term okay which allows proteins to leak out of your gut and go to places they shouldn't be they create inflammatory response I'm not a big protein yeah. pea protein person yeah. for dogs either or for people that matter a little bit mm -hmm. for people probably not so bad I'd stay away from the dogs dogs are carnivores Jess mm -hmm. right they want all their teeth are designed just to tear mm -hmm. they don't have chewing teeth you have chewing teeth mm -hmm. you have tearing teeth Cows have just grinding teeth. Mm -hmm. Horses have grinding teeth. Dogs just have tearing teeth. Tear teeth. They're, they're meant to tear that beef, tear that chicken, whatever it is, and swallow it. That's all mm -hmm. they do. They don't, they don't chew their food. So their intestinal tract as well is only designed to process that, that meat, mm -hmm. you know, that animal protein. So uh, here we, we introduce grains, wheat, we introduce gluten, which all these create inflammatory responses. Anything your body can't break down and utilize mm -hmm. becomes an inflammatory response within your body. And there's a, there's a medical saying, where there's disease, there's inflammation, where there's inflammation, there's disease. Right. So why do, we, why do we want to do that to our dogs? Right. You, know, they, you can always tell that you're feeding your dog the wrong thing, and I know you know this. When they're always going to the bathroom, when they have large fecal matter, 
because it's waste. Their body can't use it. It's just right. going in and coming out. Mm -hmm. And when you feed a good protein diet to your dog, quality meats, eggs, their their waste product is very small, and they don't go to the bathroom as as often. Mm -hmm. You know. So, have, can you testify to that? Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah. So you look, you look at the ingredients, and you know they have marketing programs so they it's all listed by weight and everybody thinks that's what I look at I see meat you know but again that can mean anything that can be tendons right you know you can see chicken that can be chicken feathers chicken beak chicken legs chicken feet chicken feet whatever yeah. you know yep. so you can't just because you see chicken you see meat that doesn't mean that you're getting what we eat right M most of it is food that's outside human consumption and you mentioned it earlier, it's products that have been thrown on the, on the floor mm -hmm. and they could sit there for days and days and days. Little known thing, and we've talked about it years ago on this show, uh, all those fat barrels that sit around all, all the restaurants, Yep. that ends up being rendered. And when they shoot out through the extruder, the kibble, mm -hmm. they spray that with that rancid fat. So that barrel had been sitting out in six months in the summertime, fermenting and rotting and, and spoiling, and it gets processed. None of that is killed. You know, you don't get sick because of the bacteria. You get sick because of the waste products the bacteria make. So let's say you have that fat that's, that's being rendered, so it's brought to a very high temperature. It stops the process of that decaying that's going on right at the point, mm -hmm. but that, that material still has all the byproducts in it of the toxins, the waste, that were produced while it was sitting out for six months in a can right. in, the back, in the back of a restaurant. So uh, you really got to look in and, yep. and kind of analyze what you are feeding. And, and a good rule is if it's cheap, there's a reason why it's cheap. <laughs> yeah. You know, junk. It's junk. junk. I, when I would lecture about animal diets, and I'd, I'd pick up a bag of a well-known product, and it was beautiful, and I would I would jokingly say, but you know, somewhat serious. In in fact, the 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 bag material, the the cardboard or whatever it was, <laughs> paper, was probably more nutritious than the stuff that was inside that. Right. You know. Mm -hmm. So um, you really got to look at what you're feeding the dog. You have to do your own research. And there there are some good dog foods mm -hmm. out there. So if it's inconvenient for you to make it, there are people that are doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you just got to start researching it, get, talking to people, mm -hmm. uh, pet going to the pet stores and, and, and talking to people that, that have some knowledge. Or some of them don't. Some of them right. are just checkout people, mm -hmm. but some of them have the knowledge. Right. And generally speaking as a as a guideline not mm -hmm. necessarily even a rule but as a guideline the more expensive it is the more it costs probably the better the ingredients that are in there mm -hmm. you know and i think that holds true true for everything right but it, I, i'll I, i'll give out a good fact over here and and jesse's aware of this you want to know what the food co what the sugar content is because your your dog or your cat cannot process sugar so i don't worry uh, or, or analyze that that labeling list of the ingredients i look at the nutritional panel so it's usually in the fold of the bag because mm -hmm. they want to hide it but you'll see protein you'll see moisture you'll see ash and you'll see fat and it's usually protein fat moisture and then ash ash could also be labeled as fiber so you add those up and it'll say 10 percent 30 percent five percent whatever the percentage is for each one of those so it's the first four and you take 100 and you subtract whatever those percentages are from 100. Whatever you have left is sugar that's in that food. So you can actually determine how much sugar is in the food you're feeding your dog who cannot process sugar mm -hmm. by taking the first four of the nutritional panel ingredients, protein, fat, moisture, and ash. And it doesn't matter whether it's dry food or canned food. You traditionally find more carbohydrates or sugars in the dry food than you do in, in a canned food. Okay, but, now here's a question you can throw out to your audience. 
<coughs> you get past those four, four or five first ingredients. Then you have all these vitamins and all these wonderful things that they put into it. So they put such little, there's no standard whatsoever. Minuscule. <laughs> and, and it's so, it's 0.0001% and it means absolutely nothing. It's all marketing, mm -hmm. you know. So one day Jess was on Health and Wellness with Dr. Ed, the radio show, and um, there was a big thing going on about grain-free food and grain food. Do you want to tell that story, Jess? Yeah, everybody thinks that, um, well, because a lot of the vets have pushed this, the dogs were having all kind of heart problems because there wasn't any taurine in the dog food. Is well, that? they were saying that grain food in, yeah, was, it was, in the grain. was better for them because grain-free grain -free food... Didn't have the taurine. No, that, that taurine wasn't even in the picture until oh. the very end. Oh, okay. So they were saying it was a grain-free versus, versus grain food, and people were not buying grain food, so the producers of the grain food started this marketing campaign and got vets to say, well, there's heart problems, and the, the grain-free was causing the heart problems. Well, if you have the grain-free and they're using a lot of legumes, I can see that happening because of those lectins that I talked about a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line was they ended up saying that taurine was in grain and not in the grain-free. Well, taurine is not in any grain. Right. Yeah. There's no grain whatsoever that has taurine in it. Taurine is very important for heart function. Taurine only comes from animal products. So it isn't whether it's grain free or grain, it's whether the, you have good protein in there. So Jess, we're at the end of the show. I need you to give information how people can get a hold of Angels for Animals and Jesse Klepsik. 724-941-5737. Want to say that again? 724-941-5737. And she'll say on that, if if it goes to voicemail, speak clearly and don't call after nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jess, thanks so much for coming on Health and Wellness Thank with you, Dr. Dr. Ed. And Merry Christmas, happy, healthy new year to you. You too. Remember, a healthy pet is a happy pet. When you're healthy, you're happy as well. Merry Christmas, happy Hanukkah, happy new year. We'll see you next year. Thanks, guys.